And it is good to be back this morning. And hope you had as good of a week as I did. Um, my wife Rachel and I are very excited to be with this body. And um, I wanted to give just a bit of introduction to my much better half, uh, Rachel, who is sitting over here um, far left. Uh, she and I have been married for 40 years. She has endured me for 40 years, uh, actually 43. We dated uh, in high school for um, uh, a few years, and uh, we have three grown daughters, all married, and nine grandchildren, seven grandsons and two granddaughters. And so uh, we had our middle daughter this week with us and her husband and their four boys, uh, and it was quite the week. Uh, just, so uh, if I'm looking at my notes a little bit more this uh, week, you'll know why. But uh, anyway, and also I am the uh, regional director for church planting for the EPC, and I also run a nonprofit that provides recruitment, assessment, and training for church planters. And so um, we have a desperate need for new churches in this country. Uh, the United States is a mission field. And we need to plant around 350,000 churches by 2050 just to keep up with the number of churches that are closing um, in comparison to the number of churches that are opening and with population growth. And I believe, and um, uh, it's widely held, that this is one of the most, um, the greatest missional opportunities that we face as a church is to plant more churches. Uh, Barrett Hendrickson, who Brian prayed for, is one of our church planters. I coach him on a regular basis. I've actually been um, to Abaco, to Marsh Harbor there, and preached uh, for him and uh, got to know his family more, and that's what I do. Uh, I encourage, I train, I bring together the church planters uh, two times a year to uh, just pour into them and to help them uh, have the support and training they need to, to plant a new church. Uh, church planting is really hard, and so that's, that's what I do, and that's what frees me up to be here uh, for the next uh, few weeks, uh, six weeks in total. Um, and so that gives a little bit more uh, context of who I am. And uh, as I said last week, we're dealing with passages over the next several weeks um, that deal with suffering. And again, the reason I want to do that is because I assume and I hope that there are people in this room that uh, are here and don't believe and are even skeptical. And maybe one of your primary issues with Christianity is this whole question of suffering. And we have um, a God that has revealed to us um, really the, the origins of suffering and how we are to face it as Christians. And I want you to hear that. And this might be a great opportunity if you have uh, unbelieving neighbors if, if you want to invite them to this series, um, I would highly encourage you to do so because I really, my heart is to really get deep into the questions and, there, and deep into the answers in the scriptures. Uh, but also, as I said last week, this series is also for Christians that have never built a theology of suffering because we are all going to suffer <laughs> and we all suffer to one degree or another constantly. And so this is a pertinent um, uh, topic and something we need to be pre prepared for, but also I want to um, present this series to those of us that have a theological base but need to be reminded. As I said last week, the gospel is like what? Anybody? <laughs> Fish. The gospel is there you go. You got to catch it fresh every day. Uh, you got to get you got to get used to me. I'm a, I love to fish, and so you're going to get a lot of those illustrations. But you've got to catch it fresh every day, and really morning, noon, and night. Um, and it has to be active in our lives. It's easy to know something, and it's easy to live, or it's it's harder to live something. And so that's what I really want to accomplish in uh, this series. So let's turn now to Romans chapter eight, one of the most 
uh, famous passages, most popular passages when it comes to uh, suffering. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 16 of Romans chapter 8. Hear now God's word. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, interesting, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for, our, for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn, therefore? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are the very words of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we need you this morning. We need you to wrestle our hearts to a place of faith, we need you to correct our thinking with your truth. And we need you, O oh God, by your spirit to move our hearts to love you in ways that we didn't think we could. Father, I pray for those in this room that are hurting. I pray for those that are suffering in the midst of suffering even now or on the heels of it and very much in the midst of their grief. Father, I pray that you would come by your spirit and speak to us through your word, illumine your word in our hearts and minds that we might think correctly about you, about ourselves, and about what happens to us and happens in this world, this side of glory. Lord, we believe, but help us in our unbelief. Show us Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Frazier and Dana Gieselman are uh, friends of Rachel and mine and, and now uh, members of the church, the last church that we planted. We planted three churches and the last church we planted in Memphis, Tennessee. 
And they, as parents and just human beings, experience the unimaginable. Um, They are parents of three daughters, but when their middle daughter was three years old, she started having seizures and was diagnosed with Batten's disease, which is a genetic disease that is terminal, um, and it, 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 it is slow going. Um, these seizures progress and progress, and eventually you lose complete control of your body until you die. And then a few weeks later, they found out that their youngest daughter, so two out of their three daughters, had this disease. And we in their community walked with them over the next several years. It was three to five years um, of them taking care of their little girls. And it was painful to watch, and it was more painful for them to endure. And it forces the question, how in the world can a loving God allow this to occur? And as we are faced with that, the scriptures that we read this morning give us real answers and real hope. Um, But I think it would be helpful for us to look at the answers that the other major religions of the world provide. Um, If you look at Hinduism, Hinduism basically says, and this is reductionistic, but for sake, I I think it's pretty dead on. Um, Hinduism says, basically, you get what you deserve. It's karma. If something bad happens to you, it is because you've done something bad. And to be honest with you, I think that is how many of us, if not most of us as Christians, feel when bad things are happening to us. Why is this happening to me? Look what I'm doing for you, God. And I'm going to use an illustration of that in my own life this morning. But that's Hinduism. It's you get what you deserve, karma. And then you have Buddhism, which says the, the problem, the real problem is not the suffering, but your desire for pleasure, your desire for happiness. So if you just get rid of desire for something better than, and just receive suffering for what it is, it's what the universe is giving us, then you will suffer less. And if you can really get to that point of you know, not really um, being moved by suffering, then you've really reached the height of existence in this universe. And then you have Islam that doesn't believe that suffering stands alone, but suffering goes alongside happiness. And so the only way we know about suffering and being unhappy is that there exists happiness. And so if you didn't have suffering, then you wouldn't have happiness. And the, um, the, the system of Islam is that of the law, and therefore, how you suffer is going to dictate how, if you go to paradise, if you go to paradise with God. And so God is watching, and God is waiting for you to suffer well. And if you suffer well, then, and only then, will you enter paradise, and it's always a question. And so Christianity says something radically different. Christianity says this in verses 16 and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we also may may be glorified with him. So the the Christian hope is not that God is waiting and watching and and it's all on us to get it right. It's not suffering for as God is the audience and him waiting and watching and, you know, are you going to get it right? Are you going to grieve too much? Are you going to lose hope? Are you going to, you know, um, just drown in hopelessness? No, we are suffering with him. Christianity is set apart by Their God, our God, who has suffered in the flesh, who literally has been separated from God, isolated from him, and sentenced to experience the the throes and the, the, the horror of hell for you and me. And therefore, we are suffering with Christ, not for Christ. Now, We are suffering for him in the sense that, or with him in the sense that 
to name the name of Jesus is to, be, is to suffer in ways uh, because we become an enemy of the world. But to suffer with Christ means m- more, uh, has, a, has a meaning like this. When Jesus was in the garden the night before he was crucified, you remember what he prayed. He, he prayed, Father, may this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. That is how we suffer with Christ. We suffer as Christ suffered. We, we, we suffer trusting the Father. Why? Because we have an inheritance. Why? Because God is using even the suffering in our lives, maybe especially the suffering in our lives, for good. And he's doing it all wrapped in his love, as we saw in this text. And so... What we see, basically, for the Christian, this is the question. It's not, will I suffer? We are going to suffer, and I'll get to that in a minute. But will my suffering mean anything? Or will it be, will it be redemptive or pointless? Will it have meaning or be meaningless? The, the Christian hope is that our suffering has has a future um, glory in the sense that we will be redeemed from it completely in a new heaven and a new earth, but also that right now God is working the worst things in our lives for good. And so the worst things that can happen to us, God can turn on on a dime and make it good and redemptive and meaningful. And that's the Christian hope. Johnny Erickson Tata, um, well, I'll get there, said this. Uh, You're probably familiar with her, but if not, um, she was in a a water skiing accident when she was a teenager and has been paralyzed from the neck down her entire life, over 40 to 50 years. And um, she uh, speaks at conferences and uh, is a strong believer. And this is what she said from her wheelchair, mind you. It's not enough to merely cope or adjust, which I think that, that is what we do most of the time. We just have to cope or adjust. No. God wants us to embrace his purpose for the pain as good and acceptable. Is that possible? Remember, I told you, I've been through some things, and I'm going to tell you more things I've been through. My, my brother took his own life on Christmas night in, I think it was 2006 or 7, 2004, excuse me. I get it. It's hard to even imagine. But when we say good, we don't mean giddy. We don't mean that we can just laugh it off. It means that we can see and know something substantive is, is being done through this horror. So our first point is this. Jesus frees us to groan with great hope. Jesus frees us to groan with great hope. When we move from, I said we planted three churches. When we moved from um, Fort Collins to Memphis, we had a trail of events that, looking back on it, is just remarkable in, in a, not a good way. <laughs> so we, Memphis is our home, but we planted a church in Mississippi, northern Mississippi, and were there 10 years. And then we went to plant a church in Fort Collins, Colorado, that has been rated the number one city in the country to raise a family and to live. And the, the weather is amazing. There's no humidity. Imagine that. Uh, there are no mosquitoes, which I can't imagine being from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, it's just a beautiful place, and if you love the outdoors, it just invites you. I think we ate more dinners on our back porch than anywhere else because it's just glorious most of the time. And you say, well, what about all that snow? Well, it snows. The next day, the sun comes back out, and you're outside again. It's really, really pretty glorious. And so when I came back to Memphis, when we came back to Memphis to plant a church, I was doing so from a true call to plant a multi-ethnic, multi-class church really seeking gospel reconciliation in the city of Memphis, which really has been paralyzed by um, the, the um, assassination of Dr. King many, many years ago. It's hard to even believe that. But Memphis is, um, I think it leads, um, it's the most violent city, or at least in the top three in the country. It's one of the poorest cities. Uh, it is a rough, rough 
rough place. And so I did not know this, but I had in the back of my mind, well, if I go back to Memphis, um, then God is going to reward me, surely. I'm leaving a place that is incredible, the number one city, and I'm going to like the last city. Literally, it was declared the last city to, be, to live in, that desirable place to live in the country this week in one of the um, magazines. Well, we moved back, and before we even get there, our middle daughter was in a horrible um, car wreck. And thank God I didn't have much money, and I bought an old Volvo, which is basically a tank, and it saved her life. Um, but it really messed up her neck. And within the first week or two of me being back, I developed a herniated disc in my neck. I couldn't move my right arm. The worst pain I've ever been in, several weeks of begging doctors to do something and finally had surgery. Um, I got well. Uh, we went um, skiing, believe it or not, in St. Louis, Missouri. That's a whole other story. And uh, it was basically ice at about 5 o'clock. And we were coming down. Rachel's an incredible um, snow. She can ski really well, but it was ice. And she fell and tore her labrum in her shoulder and had to have um, surgery, very painful surgery. And then our house burned, and we literally lost everything. And then our youngest daughter totaled her brand new car, um, and it wasn't her fault. And then I got audited by the IRS, if all that wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> to say it was a really tough season is no exaggeration. Um, and how God used that was I, I kept going back to what I know to be true. And that is, God is not punishing us specifically, but this is, this is just the, the judgment and the curse on creation in general. And I know that God is going to use this in some way, and I can give you all the ways he did. One was to humble me and to realize that I really thought God was you know, going to reward me. It was, I was being more Hindu than I was Christian. Because what this text is telling us this morning is that all of creation is under a curse. And we know why if we know our theology that basically God promised Adam death if he ate of the forbidden fruit. And Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. And not only did we as human beings, um, you know, not only were we cursed, but all of creation. And so Paul is, is building off of that and he's saying that Creation was subjected to futility, um, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. And, and therefore, the creation is groaning. Uh, South Florida feels that right now with the flooding. Um, the rest of the country feels that right now with this heat wave that apparently is unprecedented. And whereas science may throw, put forth uh, reasons we know the real reason and that is creation has been subjected to futility and there will be floods and there'll be natural disasters and our bodies no matter how well we take care of them are going to move are going to degenerate not regenerate I ran five and a half miles in high school excuse me five and a half minute miles in high school I run 10 minute miles now you know how frustrating that is? No matter what I do, no matter, it's, it's what it is. <laughs> and it's not going to get better. And I know that. Why? Because creation, including our bodies, are under a curse. But thanks be to God, he did not leave us in this condition. But he sent his own son to live and to die and to rise again so that one day, someday, we will be, we will regenerate, if you will. We will run and not be weary and walk and not be faint. Amen? That's the hope of the gospel. It's not just reconciliation personally with God. It's reconciliation of everything. It's the end of all misery. 
We said it last week. I'll probably say it every week. But all bad things will become untrue. That's the hope of the gospel. That's the pervasive nature of the gospel's hope. And, and so we groan, and creation is groaning, not as one that has no, no hope, but groaning as in uh, uh, a woman in childbirth. That's a different groaning. I mean, I can't even, I can't, I, no, I'm not even going to say that. I can't fathom the pain of childbirth. My wife can after three times. I've witnessed it. But the longing, it, it, it goes from groaning, pain, to rejoicing. And I love this illustration. That's how it's going to be in glory. Life, creation is groaning as in the, uh, the, the pains of childbirth, but one day Sunday. And then we ourselves groan as what? We wait for our adoption as sons. One commentator said this. He said it indicates this whole, you know, when Jesus comes back and we are, are revealed as the sons and daughters of God to the universe. That's, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be like this homecoming. It, it's going to be, you know, glorious. And this is how one commentator point, or describes it. It indicates that not until the day of Christ's return will it become a matter of public knowledge how much God loves them and how richly he rewards them. And he quotes Matthew 13, 43, then in the kingdom of their father, the righteous will shine as the sun. And then Daniel 2, excuse me, 12, 3, as the brightness of the firmament and as the stars forever and ever. Dear friends, Jesus, and, and, and we will be so revealed, the love of God will be so revealed in us that we will be on display for the whole universe for all of eternity. Do you know how you are longing to be noticed and loved? That is the deepest longing of every heart in this room. It's, it's what you're working toward. If you're overworking, it's, what, it's, it's, it's behind everything. We want to be to, to have this real deep and abiding and, and, and protected sense that we are adored by someone that matters. And for us in Jesus Christ, we will be on display forever. We will shine like the stars. And his love for us will be known throughout eternity. And you will never question it. And you will never feel alone again. Oh, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. What a day that will be. And this is how we, what we need to be longing for. And then the Spirit, whoop, don't know what I did. There we go. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray for as we ought. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been so hurt in such grief in, in such pain that you can't even pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I've been there. You've been there. And if you hadn't, you'll be there. I'm sorry to say. In those moments, God is not distant. The Spirit of God that lives in you is groaning and praying prayers that you can't even mutter. And the high priest, Jesus himself, hears them and runs them to the Father. We don't have some, some um, impersonal suffering as Christians. The very Spirit of God is suffering with us. Jesus understands our suffering, and the Father is, is running to us. So we have a very personal time of suffering in this life, and we are never alone. And then secondly, Jesus is redeeming our suffering by making all things go to the end of remaking us in his image. The day we had our house fire, uh, thank God, Rachel and uh, our youngest daughter, Amy Catherine, were not at home. Um, she was in a play at school, and Rachel was going to get her. She turned 16 the next day, um, so it was the day before her 16th birthday, and I got a call at about 4 or 5 in the afternoon, and from I kept getting these calls from numbers I didn't recognize, and finally one of my neighbors 
texted me and said, Richard, this is Mark, neighbor across the street, and your house is on fire. So I got in my car, and I rushed home, and, um, and I couldn't, uh, we live in, a, in downtown Memphis, and, and I, I, I could get about a quarter of a mile to, you know, away from my house, and then there were ambulances and uh, fire trucks and police and cars. It was the most chaotic, so I ran to my house. And all I had, I mean, that's the most bizarre experience, one of the most in my life. And all I had that day, I'd gone to the gym, and I'd gone to work. So I had my workout clothes. I love to run. I had my Bible, and I had my computer, and that's all I had to my name. And, and yet I stood there, and it was the most chaotic scene. I mean, there's water pouring out the front of my house. I mean, it's, it was just horrific. And I remember sitting there, or standing there, and I, it's almost, it, I had this experience, and I would write about it later, and this is how I wrote about it. I said, I had lost everything, but I'd lost nothing. In that moment, Jesus gave me the most precious gift, and that was all the stuff that I'd been preaching. You can lose everything, and Jesus is enough. Well, in that moment, those weren't words in a sermon. That was my reality. Jesus was enough and he was better than enough because in that moment losing everything I felt like I had more of him I wasn't clouded by all the stuff of life I just had him and it was beautiful and and, and that is what God does in our suffering I read Dana Gieselman again who lost her two daughters she did a blog post throughout her experience and she said this she said but as you've probably heard said the pain doesn't go away we just get better at living with it I still have moments when it all just seems like too much I can't bear to go on I have no more strength to carry on but I do not because I'm a tower of strength and determination not because I can do anything I put my mind to but it's because of Jesus I can't talk about him enough, she says. He sustains me through the darkest times, through my weakness, through my whininess, I love that, through my anger, through my pain, through my failures. He is the one holding me up. Friends, that's how God uses our pain. That's how he redeems it. He, he gives us an existential experience that he genuinely is enough and he is what we need because nothing else can give us what we need in those moments. And that's exactly what Paul said. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who were called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What is Jesus doing through your suffering? What is the Father doing in your suffering? What's the Spirit doing in your suffering? He is conforming you more and more to the likeness of Jesus. That's what was happening to me in that moment. I, was, I felt Jesus' prayer. I, don't want, I would never want this. <laughs> I would never ask for a house fire, but your will be done. Dana would, and, and Fraser Gieselman would never ask for what they received. And yet they know Jesus in a way that, that many don't because of the pain and the hurt. I just saw her Mother's Day, and this happened years ago. But this past Mother's Day, I was walking in the hallway of the church that we planted and no longer pastor. And she walked in the worship room and came out just undone she had to leave and I hugged her and still the grief is heavy but still she loves Jesus in a way that maybe many of us will never have the, um, the opportunity to understand this side of glory and that's what Jesus is doing and I think what suffering does is it forces the question do we really want to be like Jesus is that really what we want is he really everything the scriptures say he is? Is he more than just this, this prudish man?
that maybe some of us think he is. Is his laughter and joy the fruit of the Spirit? Is his love, is his kindness and his patience and his goodness and his self-control and his gentleness, is that genuinely manifested in him in a way that if we were to meet, if he were to walk into this room right now, we would give anything not only to know him but to be like him? That is what the Father is using our suffering for, to make us more and more like Jesus, less and less proud, Less and less impatient, less and less unkind, more and more full of others and less of ourselves. That is how God is using the suffering in our lives that we might let go and let him draw more near to us and live more through us. And then it's uh, so much, whoop, let me go back. Well, I'm just going to read it before we get to point three. Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this. Paul, this is earlier, obviously, in Romans. He said, we rejoice in our sufferings. You hear that? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he who has been given to us. Friends, the love of God is within us, and that is where we have to go in the midst of suffering. Therefore, Jesus uses suffering to increase our faith in his presence and love. Often the impact that we feel in the midst of suffering when we take our eyes off of Jesus is that somehow we are isolated and alone and that even God doesn't care. I have felt that so many nights and I know many of you have too. But Paul comes to the opposite conclusion. Listen how he ends this whole thing. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And and what he does is he points to this golden chain of of salvation. He he says, For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he will glorify? No, he glorified. Paul talks about our glorification The new heaven and the new earth, the perfection of all things because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as have already happened in the past tense. In in the mind of God, and and Paul was getting this, we have already been glorified. Why? Because it is sealed by by the blood of Jesus and therefore it cannot not happen. Our glorification... The, the goodness and the reward of, of everything that we will inherit in glory, we can bank on it with everything we are as if it's already happened. Why? Because of Jesus. And also, Paul ends this text by saying, no, um, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why? For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is the hope of the gospel. That no matter what the world takes away from us, even though we might be limping into glory, glory is ours. And the love of Christ right now must be our strength. Why and how can the love of God be our strength in the midst of suffering? It's because as 1 John 4 tells us, God is love and we have been made in his image. Do you get that? We have been made by love for love. Therefore, what you're looking for is the love of God. (laughs) Behind every desire, what you're really looking for is the love of God. As I enjoyed 
this um, peeling and eat them shrimp that I cooked last night. And I love peeling and eat them shrimp. And it's, it gets down to this basic reality. The enjoyment that I was having there was a, an expression of God's love for me. Multiply that out to everything in your life. <laughs> I love to run. Why? Because God has get, not only given me the ability, and I love to run because I feel the love of God in the midst of that, and I know that his love for me is better than the enjoyment of running. The love of God is with us and in us because it is there through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And nothing can take it away. And nothing will take it away. Dear friend, is that your hope? Is that your hope? Because that's the hope of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing hope that you've given us. And I pray that you would drive the love of Christ deeper into our hearts, deeper into our minds, that we might know in the deepest way that we are loved by you and therefore we have purpose and we have a future and that nothing can separate us from your love and nothing, even the greatest suffering, can destroy us because we're yours. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that you would do a mighty work in their lives. Father, I pray for one who may have, have never believed this. I pray, God, that you would give them the faith to believe the realities of the gospel that is just that good. Lord, I pray that we would leave here today encouraged to the point that we would want to tell somebody else about the love of God and how he meets us, even and maybe especially at the point of our suffering. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.